So I have now seen the first few episodes of Star Trek Strange New Worlds and I've got to say I'm loving it. It's great. It's the closest that the Star Trek franchise has ever come to recapturing the magic of the original series because that to me will always be the definitive. The original series, the 1960s series, will always be the best iteration of Star Trek and here are five reasons why. Number one, it's the simplest. Now, admittedly, this is where the original shows I was going to have it easiest. The longer a fictitious universe exists, the more complicated it gets. And indeed, the universe of Star Trek evolves just over the three seasons of the original show. Uh, we learn a bit about the Federation. We get to find out who the Romulans are. We meet the Klingons. We hear about the Prime Directive. But certainly, when it starts, it's just got the most simple and pure and engaging premise a show ever had. It's just about a bunch of great mates in a ridiculously cool spaceship, blasting around the galaxy, battling monsters, pulling chicks and getting into scrapes. How could you not want to get into that? But none of that would work were it not for number two. They absolutely nailed the character dynamic. Again, this is something that every subsequent iteration of Star Trek has either tried to emulate or consciously resisted. The reason Trek works is not because of the effects, it's not even because of the script, it's because the relationship between the characters is so relatable. And for all that we know that the casting of these characters was a fairly roundabout process, they absolutely ended up with all the right guys for the job. Particularly, bless him, the late great Leonard Nimoy. Because in theory, Spock is the role of a lifetime. It's this golden opportunity. It's the second lead in this big-ish budget, full-color, primetime, nationally networked space show. Except if you look at it from an actor's point of view, it's a fucking nightmare. So Len, all that acting stuff that actors do, yeah, all that acting, acting things, yeah, don't do that. Can't do any of that. No acting. No acting. He never gets scared, he never gets angry, he smiles maybe once a season. Okay, Len, here's what you can do. You can do this. Fascinating. That's all you can do, Len. That's all the acting. Oh, and by the way, we made you up as a six-foot pixie. Break a leg, Len. And yet for all this, Leonard Nimoy fucking nails it to the point where Zach Quinto, Ethan Peck, and everybody else who's ever tried to play Spock, or indeed any other Vulcan, just kind of has to do a Leonard Nimoy impression to get it to work. Number three, as I already alluded to, this is the coolest version of the Starship Enterprise. Now, one of the few minor niggles I have with Star Trek Strange New Worlds is they couldn't resist tweaking the design of the Enterprise a bit. Now, this is absolutely meant to be the Starship Enterprise that Captain Kirk is in charge of in the very first series. But they've tweaked it a little bit. They've given it those flared engine pylons like the one from the movies had. And I don't know why they felt the need to do this because the original design for the Enterprise is the single most beautiful spaceship design in science fiction history. And the thing is, it's a really, really odd design for a starship. I mean, we've totally gotten used to it now. You know, we're totally used to the shape of the Enterprise. We just look at that, we think Starship. But if you actually examine it, it's just, it's, it's weird. It's like, all right, it's a flying saucer with a neck. And then it's got this kind of long fat body and then the engines are on the end of these sort of ladder things and they're not attached to it. Who designs a spaceship like that? And it totally works and it's just defined what starships look like for, uh, well, three or four generations now. Number four, it's actually weirdly ahead of its time. Now, when I rewatch those original episodes, because they're all up on Netflix at the moment, have a look at them anytime you like, I am always struck by how horribly dated so much of it isn't. Okay, there are a few bits which kind of clang in the modern era. You've got to say some of the sexual politics is fairly questionable. The racial politics, of course, was decades ahead of its time. But it's remarkable how much of it hasn't dated, or certainly hasn't dated anything like as much as science fiction which was around at the time, or indeed a hell of a lot of what's come along in the meantime. For my mind, next gen, if you look at it now, feels more painfully 80s than the original series feels painfully 60s. And I'm not just talking about the production design and the visuals here, excellent though they were for the time and the budget they had to work with. Now, of course, it's worth pointing out that the versions on Netflix are the remastered ones from about 10 years ago for which they redid all the model effects. But they didn't put in whole new model sequences to zhuzh up the effects bits because the old effects were rubbish. The problem was the model effects were shot on 16mm. The rest of the show, shot on 35mm, blows up to HD beautifully. The model effects look grainy as shit, so they just had to replace them. And in fairness, the CG sequences they've replaced them with are strict homages to the original model sequences. But I'm thinking more in terms of the storytelling and the way the storytelling hasn't dated. One of my favourite episodes is Devil in the Dark, which is about a series of mysterious deaths at an off-world mining colony. 
Now, one of the things that strikes me when I watch this episode is that the guys playing the miners on this mining colony are just playing miners. Obviously, the word came down from the director, guys, you're miners. Just play them like miners. Miners are miners, whether they're on the planet Janus 6 or in Pittsburgh. You're just miners. And so this mining colony, for all that the sets are a bit ropey, actually kind of feels like a real going concern. And this is, I would remind you, a good 12 years before Alien apparently invented the whole concept of blue-collar space exploration. Lastly, number five, it created such a seductive vision of the future that it's very difficult to escape from. And I don't just mean Star Trek has difficulty escaping from that utopian vision of the future that was created for the original show. American science fiction in general has difficulty escaping from it. Star Trek casts such a long shadow over American sci-fi, particularly American TV sci-fi. When they're not remaking Star Trek under the banner Star Trek, they're often as not remaking Star Trek under a different name. I remember when Babylon 5 started in the 90s and a lot of people were like, oh, you've got to check this out. It's like the antithesis of Trek. It's like the anti-Trek. And I watched it and I thought, it's a very minor variation on Trek, isn't it? It's basically still Trek. And even recently, when Seth MacFarlane does the Orville, I'm like, oh, this is exciting. Seth MacFarlane's doing a Star Trek piss take. And then I watch it and I'm like, no, Seth MacFarlane's just doing Star Trek. It's just Trek with Seth and maybe two dick jokes per episode, but it's not a parody, it's just more Trek. So for good or ill, Star Trek's influence is almost entirely inescapable. But anyway, now we've got Strange New Worlds, which like I said, is the closest we're ever gonna get to a new series of the original show, and I'm loving every minute of it, and if you're watching it, I hope you are too. And I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you again soon. Mitch out.